When about a year and a half ago, we received the proposal for the creation of the SNF Center for Precision Psychiatry and Mental Health at Columbia, we appreciated the vision it presented immediately. However, it was hard to understand the particulars of the more immediate impact it would have on the well-being of patients. SNF has supported numerous projects that advance knowledge with the prospect of positive practical outcomes for society in the longer run. However, on health-related projects, we are particularly sensitive when it comes to the tangible impact that they will have. Health pro problems can be tough on individuals and their families. The faster they can be addressed, the better. Any questions you may have had on the immediate impact of the project were answered in a cold, rainy March morning in 2022, when after countless meetings and preparations, we met Dr. Sander Marx and Professor Joseph Gogos on location at Columbia University. That is, we met them at the locations where the services of the SNF Center for Precision Psychiatry and Mental Health at Columbia would be provided. There were two things particularly that impressed us. First, the horizontal network of departments and institutions that were participating in the holistic effort to identify and treat patients. Second, the enthusiasm and conviction of everyone involved in the well-being of their patients. No stone was left unturned. We are extremely happy that the impact of the center's work is already being felt, as we will hear in the next few sessions. Before I give the floor to Sander, I want to acknowledge the significant and tireless contributions of our colleagues Dimitri and Danai, along with numerous SNF colleagues from all SNF departments that have made our grant to the SNF Center for Precision Psychiatry and Mental Health at Columbia, and all the other SNF Global Health Initiative grants possible. We thank them sincerely. Sander, it's great to have you back at Nostos, and we're all looking forward to the next session of the conference, which will start very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I wanted to start by first thanking uh, a few instrumental people that are the reason why we're standing here. Um, first of all, most significantly, Andreas Strakopoulos, pa uh, Panos, and Eliana, who have helped us try to figure out how to do this, who've been our instrumental partners in trying to figure out how to improvise and revolutionize care and psychiatry, and have been extraordinary. I wanted to mention um, Antonio Samaras, who was mentioned by Andres as well, who has been extremely supportive and a source of inspiration and a dear friend to the center that we, that we founded. It was on this stage yesterday that I sat here in the audience with probably many of you uh, with the privileged position of hearing uh, President Obama and Andres have a conversation about what constitutes a democracy and what are the basic principles that make a democracy work. And as I was sitting here, um, right there on the left side, um, President Obama was articulating that if a democracy is working at its basic foundations, the, patient, the people in a, found, in a democracy have a sense of worth and are treated with a sense of worth and with dignity. And I think when hearing that, that really sort of um, triggered my thinking into saying that I hope that by the end of my talk or this section of a talk where our center is giving a, a number of different talks back to back, I hope that by the end of my section in the next 25, 30 minutes, that I can stimulate you in thinking about what it means for a patient with mental illness, um, what, what a sense of self-worth and dignity means to a person like that, a person you might see on the subway or on the, in the street, homeless or disheveled or struggling in some capacity, that it's, it's not always easy to, to realize the worth and the dignity in a person like that. And my hope is that by the end of this section that I'm going to take you through that 
um, that you'll see that there's a lot there to relate to and connect with and admire. Um, we're, gonna t we're gonna share a story of colleagues of ours at Columbia who treated an individual who's been a source of inspiration for us and has been a transformative experience for us all. So I wanna share that with you guys here today at, at Nostos as, a, as an experience that we think for our center is going, going to be uh, setting the standard for what's to come. But before starting with that, I wanted to do a brief thought experiment or sort of try to frame things in a way because the, the topic of my talk is introducing a precision medicine-based approach to psychiatry. Now, you may have heard about precision medicine. There's, it's sort of like a buzzword a term or terms that are being used a lot in all facets of, of medicine these days. Um, and the basic notion of precision medicine is that you customize care, you tailor the care to the cause of an individual sitting in front of you in your office as a physician, and that by tailoring care to the individual cause of the individual person's illness sitting in front of you, you get better outcomes, you get better uh, efficacy, you get less side effects, and ultimately our patients do better. And the question I want to pose besides thinking about the dignity and worth of our patients is, could this kind of an approach lead to better care that ultimately contributes to more dignity and worth in our patients that they feel they're being better cared for. Before jumping into the specifics of introducing a precision medicine-based approach, I wanted to say what has been said several times yesterday by a lot of our esteemed colleagues, which is something that I think most of you know, which is that mental illness is extraordinarily common and the way it affects us, it affects us all. Everybody sitting in this, in this hall either has been affected by some mental health struggle at some point or another, or knows people in their family who are. And if you look at the World Health Organization's numbers, the numbers don't lie. The neuropsychiatric disorders as a, as a group, as a whole, are the world's leading cause of disability-adjusted life years. And what that means is, this is a time-based measure of impact of suffering. And so this measure actually incorporates premature mortality, so people dying prematurely. It was uh, Dr. Koplowitz yesterday talking about suicide, which of course is a is a, is, a, is a horrible event to happen to any family and individual who, who succumbs to that. But it's not just premature mortality from suicide and causes associated with mental health, but it's also the, the, the years lost to not working, to not being functional, to not being able to have significant relationships, to not be able to get out of society what President Obama and Andreas were talking about, your sense of worth and dignity, and being a, a participating member of society. The World Health Organization rates neuropsychiatric disorders at the top. So the urgency and the, the significance of the problem is profound. Now, I mentioned precision medicine, and, and President Obama was here yesterday with Andrea, so I, I thought it would be helpful to remind people that it was President Obama who initiated the precision medicine initiative while in the White House. This was back announced in January 30th of 2015. And the formulation was sort of boiled down to this, that the promise of precision medicine is that you're supposed to deliver the right treatments at the right time, every time, to the right person. So again, it's about customization of care. And the presumption is, and this has now been proven for many disorders, particularly in oncology, that if you do that, you start to see things that when I was in medical school, not even that long ago, we didn't even think were possible in terms of recovery uh, and reconstitution. Now, psychiatry is kind of the stepchild in medicine. We, we often think that once you have a condition that's chronic in psychiatry, that you're sort of meant to succumb to that, and that's your lifelong history. And even if that's true, there's a lot of good that can be done for individuals that struggle with lifelong struggles like, like autism and the social communicational issues that come with it, or psychosis. But what if that assumption is wrong? What if some individuals who have a condition and a diagnosis like that, if you tailor care to their cause of their version of that, what if you might see a very dramatic improvement that we've never seen before? And what we hope to do today is to start to show you what we think is one of the first examples of just that. And we thought it was very fitting that with our partnership with Andreas and SNF to do that today on January 23rd at Nostos, we wanna to talk to you guys about moving the needle and setting the bar higher and showing what can be accomplished when you try to go for a cause of a condition, even if it's an intimidating one like schizoaffective disorder. To paint sort of the picture of what precision medicine can be like, to look at something that's profoundly impressive, we stand on the shoulders of giants. I always give the same example. People who've heard me speak before probably will at this point roll their eyes, but this example just explains exactly what this is about. So this is a study done maybe now 10 years ago. It was on the cover of the Times, three consecutive days, and this picture was the first picture I saw. And I remember thinking, look, why is this on the front page? 
and it was about um, melanoma, skin cancer, a particularly aggressive form of skin cancer. In fact, one of the most ag ag aggressive forms caused by a, a mutation, an alteration in the genetic code of a gene called BRAF. Now, there's many different genes that can give rise to melanomas, and there's many different types of mutations. That's not really the point of worth getting into. What's worth mentioning is that this was one of the worst mutations to get. And if you got this, you were basically, by the time you were diagnosed, you were on death's doorstep. Because by the time you got diagnosed with genetic testing, you looked like this. And so this is an actual living patient who presented for a study that to this day, I don't know how these people had the courage to do this study. They had a drug that worked for this BRAF mutation and led to a correction of what the mutation of BRAF mutation carriers does to the proteins that are encoded by that, protein, by, that, by that gene. And the idea is that giving a medicine to these patients would be that it would restore normal cellular function. And they had done their, they had done their, their due diligence, they had tested this in preclinical trials, and they found this drug is supposed to work, it needs to work, it looks like it's working. And so they did a trial that I've never seen in my life up until that point, which was they took patients who were dying Patients who were on death's doorstep, just like this patient here, what you see in black is the cancer that spread from one lesion on the skin all throughout the body to the bones. And in essence, this patient was gonna die in a matter of months. Now to do a trial with a patient that is dying, it doesn't matter how good your drug is. Because if that patient dies for reasons that are not related to you and your drug, if you don't get the drug to them in time, let's say, that drug is never gonna make it to the clinic. That is never gonna happen. So for people to have that much faith in their drug to take patients who were dying, where arguably the need was the highest, was one of the most courageous and initially seemingly stupid things to do. But then their trial, of course, shows this. This is the same exact patient. This is not a trick with Photoshopping or anything. This is the same patient in one month. And that patient is alive 10 years later. This patient was going to get two to four months median survival. And this patient is alive 10 years later. Now, in medicine, we are still trying to figure out what does this mean, like, do you stay on this drug lifelong? But what we do know is that a person who was on death's doorstep is alive and still with us today. Now, that may not be possible for all of us who have cancer one day, but it might be possible for some, and we should strive for this. And so now in psychiatry, the question is, what if we go after the same thing? So the question is, can this be realized in psychiatry? So when we partnered with Andreas Rokopoulos and the SNF, this was the central question. If we go after the cause of an individual's form of mental illness sitting in front of you, not hypothetically, not in a classroom, not here on a slide deck, but actually sitting in front of me in my office or with my colleagues who are actually providing care at Columbia, how could we get to the point that we could figure out the cause of that person's mental illness and that we could treat that and that we would ultimately, the, the only measure that matters is, is that person's life easier? Is their quality of life better? Are they getting more sense of self-worth and dignity like was discussed yesterday? And so the center was setting out, the center that we created with my two co-directors who were mentioned, Dr. Joseph Gogos and Dr. Stephen Kushner, who you'll meet in a minute, um, was to figure all this out. And so the work that the center is doing, as is shown here schematically, is to look at the ideology, the causes of an individual's condition in front of you. We wrote genetic, but that can also be autoimmune then to take those findings into what are called model systems, to test a cause that you find in an individual in an animal or research stem cell model. The idea is, of course, to go after therapeutic discovery, look for disease mechanism. You have a genetic or an autoimmune cause, but what is the mechanism by which that mutation actually leads to a disease? You want to screen drugs, so you want to develop drug screening platforms, do biomarker studies, and ultimately target engagement studies and bring precision psychiatry trials back to the individual that you did your testing with. This is not something that you want to spend 10 years doing. You want to make this efficient enough that you can actually do this within weeks to months of a person sitting in front of you. Ultimately, that's what we're striving to develop. As an example of this, our center um, is going to try to carry out one of the first, if not the first, precision psychiatry clinical trials based on a genetic cause of a psychiatric condition. We're aiming to start this in the next year, 2024, so we hope next year NOSTA is to be talking about this. Um, and it involves a founder population, a population that is a genetic isolate. In this case, the Old Order Amish. The Old Order Amish uh, live mostly in Pennsylvania and also in parts of Ohio, and are a population that derives from three major waves of immigration. 
The original founders came from two large families that were intermarried and came from Switzerland and Germany and were Anabaptists in faith. And at the time, this was not a, an expression of their Christian faith that was tolerated. So there was um, a lot of persecution and they fled to the new world, America, to try to establish their community without the fear of persecution. The original founders were only 60 people that came on one boat. And then there were two more waves subsequently and you have a population of 360,000 people. So you have a relatively confined, what is called gene pool. So the, 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 the biology of these individuals is very comparable. These people resemble each other in many ways, which makes it easier to carry out trials because you can compare individuals. But also, unfortunately, these individuals have high rates of mutations that cause illnesses that in the general population are rare and hard to find. And so this is what we're trying to do. There's a gene called set D1A, which is the single gene that's the most strongly associated with schizophrenia, the condition where you hear voices and see things. And it was discovered by the, by the Gogos lab, one of our co-directors, as this gene that's most strongly associated with schizophrenia. It's since, been since then replicated. And the Gogos lab also found out that there was actually a treatment, just like in oncology, that if you targeted set D1A associated disease mechanisms with what is called an LSD1 inhibitor, you could rescue the effects on neuronal function, on how that brain of, of in this case, a mouse model, showed disease. And so these were things that could be restored back to normal. What was also exciting is that in work that Dr. Gogs and I did is we found out that the Amish and Mennonites actually had mutations in this gene at relatively high rates, while the general population had this rarely. And so it allows for an opportunity now in next year to start to take this LSD1 inhibitor and try to see if we can provide optimal care for folks in the Amish community and then to generalize it from there to the general population. So it's an example of a first precision psychiatry trial, maybe the first one ever, where we're gonna take a genetic cause of schizophrenia and target the disease mechanism associated with that genetic cause with a specific treatment to try to take a precision medicine-based approach. Okay. The second and last example that I wanna give and leave you with, I hope will stimulate your thinking. Um, this is essentially science inspired by patients. This is the second example. The first one was about the was about the trial we're gonna do looking at a genetic cause of schizophrenia. The second example is an autoimmune cause. And this involves a patient who received care at Columbia University Medical Center by Dr. Anka Askenazi, uh, who's in our rheumatology department as well as other clinicians. And we're here to tell her story on their behalf. And we're here to tell the story to show what our, our work is on the research side to figure out how to help people in the future. But her story will, I think, will, will impress you. So meet Miss Divine Cruz. Divine Cruz is a 21-year-old Hispanic woman born and raised in the Washington Heights, which is where Columbia University's medical center is based. And at age nine, nine, developed both auditory and visual hallucinations as well as delusions. To be specific, she started hearing voices, as many people with psychosis do, and as many of you in the audience who know somebody who struggles with psychosis will recognize, of a voice that's commenting on their behavior, always commenting, negative, negative comments, you don't look good, you should kill yourself, all the time, nonstop. Visual hallucinations of a face of a man she did not know coming through the wall and a hand reaching towards her. Frightening things, delusions about being pregnant when she wasn't, despite many reassuring tests showing that she was not. Further slipping away from her family. Ultimately, she developed a catatonic state, which is a state where you freeze and become very stiff. Movements would slow down and ultimately would have a harder time answering questions. And essentially was sort of disappearing in front of her family's eyes. She was there, but she was not there being able to relate and communicate and connect with her loved ones. And this led to her first hospitalization at age nine. And so usually when somebody gets sick this early, that doesn't bode well for what lies ahead. Throughout her childhood, divine, and her teenage years, she was hospitalized at least 12 times. These are things that her clinicians have shared with us and we're sharing with you as a, as a, as a testament to telling a story that until last year, I didn't think you could come back from. During these hospitalizations, she was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, which is a primary psychotic disorder where you hear voices and have psychotic symptoms usually pretty much continuously, as well as having mood symptoms like depression superimposed or coming back and forth in between them, these psychotic episodes. Despite the lengthy hospitalizations and many psychotropic medications that were tried, the psychiatric meds, basically nothing worked. And there was a further descent for Divine, further into 
functional impairment, withdrawal from the social circles and loved ones, and essentially disappearing in front of her parents' eyes into somebody who didn't trust anybody anymore and was continuously frightened and, and withdrawn. Due to her frequent hospitalizations and her chronically, chronic severe psychosis, she essentially missed out on a childhood. There was no childhood to speak of. She didn't have play dates. She didn't go to school for most of this time. She didn't learn basic skills socially. She was mostly kept in the home or was spending time in hospitals trying to f flee from things that weren't even there but in her experience were real. And this is, as a family, is heartbreaking. Her siblings will talk about this still with tears in their eyes. Now, fast forward to June 2022, last year, to the year, to the month. At age 20, Divine at this point was taking seven psychotropic medications, of which two were uh, antipsychotics. And she presented to the emergency room at Columbia University's Medical Center, and it was there that Dr. Anka Askenazi, who is the head of the lupus program and is part of our rheumatology department, confirmed a diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus, which you probably know as lupus or have heard about as SLE. Uh, and subsequently, it was Dr. Askenazi that led her care team going forward. She was hospitalized in the Department of Psychiatry uh, at Columbia University's Medical Center, and it was there that a team of psychiatrists, rheumatologists, general internists, and medical ethicists got together to ensure that Divine would receive what we consider the optimal best level of care that was possible for someone who had a lupus diagnosis. But what's critical is that this team was thinking in a revolutionary way. They were thinking that the central medical hypothesis should be what if lightning did not strike twice? What if her schizoaffective disorder, her psychosis, her voices were actually at least partially, if not entirely, caused by her lupus, the neurolupus in this case, as you call it, and that by treating the primary cause of that psychotic disorder, just like in oncology with the BRAF mutation when you see this miraculous recovery, and just like we're going to study with sed D1A with the LSD1 inhibitor, what if you target that autoimmune disease might you see a more robust response than the typical care in psychiatry would accomplish for a person with psychosis? And so that's basically what people tried to figure out. Dr. Askenazi and her team implemented the Leiden International Neurolupus Treatment Guideline, which defines how a patient who shows up with neurolupus should be treated. Now, I want to point out, people that have psychosis usually don't get the standard of care because people feel that somehow they're beyond reach of, of, of recovery. Dr. Askenazi and her team and the other clinicians did not feel that way and implemented a minimum of six cycles of treatment. Each of these cycles were three days long. On all three days, she get high, gets what is, are called high-dose pulse treatment of steroids. So you probably all know what steroids are. Steroids are medicines you take to suppress your immune system. They've been around for a very long time, but they still work quite effectively. And in this case, you give a very high dose, 1,000 grams of this medicine for three consecutive days to suppress the immune system. Dr. Askenazi also would give another drug, cyclophosphamide, which is a potent immunosuppressant chemotherapeutic agent that in concert, synergistically with the steroids, um, inhibits and decreases autoimmune-mediated inflammation by decreasing specifically immune cells that are called lymphocytes and neutrophils and makes them, the numbers go down. After completion of each of these three cycles, because this was implemented extremely carefully and cautiously, Divine would be given at least one month to let her body restore and let her immune system bounce back. And throughout her whole treatment, she was continuously, continuously assessed by her clinical team for possible side effects from both the immunotherapy and to see whether her psychiatric symptoms worsen. Because sometimes immunotherapy can worsen your psychiatric symptoms, at least temporarily. So she was monitored all the time. Now, this is what I want to tell you guys. After the second cycle of treatment, we saw the clinical team saw things and share with us, and we by extension have sort of experienced this through the clinical team from the sidelines. They saw, and by extension, we saw things that we have never seen before. After the second cycle was completed of treatment, her psychiatric symptoms started to improve. And I don't mean improve subtly, like you see with an antipsychotic for psychosis, but I mean dramatically. Visual hallucinations were disappearing. Auditory hallucinations were becoming less frequent. The volume went down of these voices. It was easier to ignore them. And you started hearing descriptions of a person whose attention and ability to concentrate were stored. Now, we don't have a script for this. We don't see patients coming back from this condition improving in their cognition. It doesn't happen. We, I, I've never heard of a single case like that. She started resuming writing poetry. Fourth cycle, auditory hallucinations, gone. No more talking voices commenting on her. She would come in and tell her lupus team Today, I mark the day as the day that the voices stopped. Now, 
that sounds like a catchy catchphrase, but we have never heard a patient who announced that and where that actually was the case, and it continued to be the case. It turns out that in her case so far, this has held up. After the fifth cycle, her delusions about being pregnant, which is a much harder thing to treat because it's deeply ingrained thinking in your th thinking patterns that takes much longer treatment to, to restore, even that started to resolve. Critically, people with psychosis, and this is not often talked about, lack an ability to what is called reality test. And what that means is the ability to test between what is real and what is not. As I'm talking to you now, somebody backstage might drop a cup of water and you might hear that, and all of you in the audience, presumably not experiencing psychosis now, can tell that difference from what I'm saying and can say, hey, what was that sound? Oh, it was probably something there. It's not him, he doesn't have a cup of water. It's probably in the back. That quick thinking steps that you make is something that a person with psychosis cannot easily do. So when they hear a sound like that, they might think, well, who did that? Is somebody listening? Is somebody looking at me? Is somebody dropping something from above? So you're constantly undergoing a barrage of what are called stimuli that you can't filter. You can't sense what is real, what is not, what's important, what is not. So you're constantly in a state of anxiety because of that. Her reality testing came back. Now, hearing her clinicians describe that, we just have not heard of a, of a person regaining reality testing after you spend 10 years in psychiatric hospitals. I don't know a single case like that. Finally, neuropsych a neuropsychologist tested her after the last cycle of treatment six months later who wasn't aware of her, of her illness prior and deemed her to be essentially not having schizoaffective disorder nor cognitive impairment associated with it. And her clinical team was sort of left scratching their heads, like what, what is going on here exactly? Currently, her, her treatment is being tapered off. She's being tapered off all psychotropic medications. Her outpatient psychiatry team is developing skills to begin working, to help her begin working and living independently. Her Columbia Psychiatry Cognitive Remediation team is helping improve her cognition. And given the remarkable improvement, her family now frequently asks her to independently, on her own, babysit her nieces and nephews. Now, we can talk about outcome measures in trials and like somebody improving on some scale, but ultimately, a family like hers, like Devine's, who cared for her and her siblings who have their own children, for them to entrust her with the care of her nieces and nephews to us was, and to her clinical team was the ultimate indication that this was somebody who was really restoring back to life. She intends to apply to college in the fall of 2024 with a major in creative writing, and she's now writing poetry again about her recovery and expressed a goal to specifically have her poetry published. Now, from a scientific perspective, this is a very exciting thing for me to share with you. We collaborated with Yale, uh, with Rajiv, and with Frank Pavazano at Columbia to take scans from PET scans from uh, Divine and look at whether we could actually, for the first time, understand what psychosis might be in her case, not in everybody's case, in her case. And a PET scan is a scan where you take what is called a tracer and you look at a molecular target, in this case called SV2A. We looked in her brain from a research perspective in collaboration with our partners at Yale and in the Columbia Hospital System, and we're saying, can we actually see where the inflammation is? And we were able to actually see it because her case was so dramatic and because we were coming to the specific cause with the right tracer, just like in cancer with BRAF, we were now actually seeing for the first time, or maybe one of the first times, if not the first time, what the psychosis was, was really about in, on a biological level. We started seeing inflammation, that was affecting synaptic density. So the connections between nerve cells, brain cells in the brain, were being removed because of the inflammation. And so there was less connectivity, less connections between nerve cells and brain cells in the frontal part of the, of the brain, in the hippocampus where you form your memories, and in a part called the anterior cingulate. Now the information flow between those brain areas is now impaired. And so for the first time we're starting to see what circuitry, what part of the brain regions that are not connected, are not leading to proper information flow through the brain and might cause the brain to say, that's a voice that's talking to me. We've never been able to do that in an individual patient. Then with treatment, as we saw her recovery, we also started to see the brain remodel itself in those same three actual regions where the inflammation was. We saw the brain starting the recovery process to reprocess how the brain needs to be connected. So I want to share this with you. This is actually Divine's brain. And it's from our perspective as scientists, this is a, a breathtaking experience to watch this, and we wanted to share this at Nostos, June 2023, with you. So this is her actual brain. This is not some, some, some made-up brain. This is a rendering of her MRI data showing Divine's brain, and it's becoming translucent now, like a glass brain, so you can see through it. And now you'll see the areas where the inflammation was highest, 
thought to be highest and where the loss of synaptic connections between brain cells was the highest. Her frontal part of her brain, that's where there was 30% loss of connections between nerve cells. Then the interior cingulate, 25 to 30% as well, and then the hippocampus, where the memories are formed. And the connections between these three regions. Now after treatment, as she started to recover, it was those same three regions where you saw the brain remodel connectivity in an individual sitting in front of us. Hippocampus, where the memories are formed, anterior cingulate, and the frontal pole of the frontal cortex. Now, to us, this is an extraordinary moment. I still look at this video all the time thinking of the possibilities of where this could leave psychiatry. But at the end of the day, it's hearing from the clinical team about Divine and her recovery that all you have to do is really listen to that story to realize what is possible in psychiatry and what we need to strive for, what should be our standard. And I'll, I'll end this with a very brief anecdote that will sort of underscore that last point. When Divine was better, there was an argument between her and a family member that was like any argument in any family. I've had these arguments with my family. And as would often happen, the local police would pick her up out of care and bring her to the local hospital because they felt, you know, you never know, maybe it's the psychosis rearing its head. Now, her family didn't want her to go to the emergency room because they, they knew that she was fine, but she's in the ER, and in the ER, the psychiatrist calls her clinical team and says, and this, this is something that I'll never forget, hearing from my clinical partners, Dr. Askenazi and her team heard a call where they said, you know, this patient looks amazing. The psychiatrist said, in fact, she looks better than I do on my best day. She looks like a star. But I'm, I'm, I'm saddened that she has grandiose ideas that are clearly not based in reality because Divine is talking about being interviewed by the Washington Post about her experience. And she's talking about being at this festival called Nostos in Greece and Obama's gonna be there. Two days after she was in that emergency room, she was discharged very quickly. Divine was interviewed by Richard Seam, who's a journalist who's in attendance here, and she told her story to the world, and the reaction to Divine has been extraordinary. She was in the Washington Post, and yes, she is at Nostos here today, and I would like to actually bring her out right now. Please welcome Divine. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a hug. <laughs> All right. You wanna take that turn? Okay. So, Divine, please have a seat. Your mic is right there. So it goes without saying that Divine is our inspiration and our hero, but Divine first wanted to talk about mic checks and things like that. <laughs> Hello everyone, hope you guys are having a good day. I'll be doing a mic check. So everyone named Michael, please stand up. <laughs> it's okay, you guys don't have to stand Oh, okay, you stood up. <laughs> okay. okay, well now I'll continue with the questionnaires and answers. So, <laughs> welcome. Uh, Divine, it's, it's lovely to have you here. Um, this is your first time in Greece, I think, so what, is, what has it been like uh, to be here specifically in Athens? Yes, I'm grateful to be here because not so, pe not so many people where I am from have the opportunity to travel to other countries or experience what I am experiencing. Never in my life did I imagine that I would be sitting here in front of you to share my experience. Also, to spend the last few days in Athens, I have to say that I am impressed with the beauty of the city and the warmth of the Greek people. There you go. Um, I know this is a little bit painful to talk about, but I think it's important for people to hear this directly from you. Your clinical team has spoken with you about this extensively, and you've indicated that you're comfortable sharing some of this with the audience to make people understand what you went through, but can you tell me a little bit about what things were like when you were struggling with the mental health issues? What, what was life like then? For the past 10 years, I couldn't develop the skills that I needed to become an independent woman. 
as it was hard to remember the task and participate in my education and school's activities with a clear mind. Symptoms from schizoaffective disorder were keeping me isolated from our community. I was bullied. People would misinterpret and judge my behavior, and people would assume that I was not able to understand things related to the choices in my life. It was hard for me to say how I felt while I was in the crisis, but now I'm able to share my emotions with my family and friends to prevent hospitalizations in the future. Now, the last year has been a remarkable year of recovery. So could you say something about that, what it's been like to come out of that kind of a state and how, how have you experienced that? The symptoms I have experienced over the past 10 years include hearing voices, seeing things that are not there, becoming in mute and socially isolated. After I started the immunotherapy, I no longer thought I was pregnant when I was not. I no longer struggle trying to make decisions and the tasks I have to accomplish, I no longer forget to do. I also no longer hear voices or see things that aren't there. I remember the day clearly that the voices had stopped and that I was able to tell the difference between what is real and what is not. And lastly, maybe could you say something about your plans for the future? Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, That's okay. The plans I now have for the future are nothing compared to how I was thinking before I got the immunotherapy. Back then, I wasn't thinking about applying for more education or what kind of permanent career job to pursue. I want to become an art therapist. I also want to publish my poetry to share my experience with other people who might be struggling with similar issues or want to understand what I went through. I am also planning to apply for college in the fall with a major in creative writing. I will now begin to read my poem called Shatter the Wall. Also, before I share the poem, if you guys want to hear more of my poetry, it's on Instagram. Majestic Poetry with Two Y's. Okay, here I go. Shatter the Wall by Divine Cruz. Break every chain, they say, before I used to get my mind played with. There was no end to this game. All people would do was spread hate. When all I was trying to do was reach the date when I would make a decision to shatter the wall. Darkness wants to consume us all, but we must trust those who put us down, those who want to put us in another town never to be seen again. Da they were your person? Well, now it's more like David fighting Goliath to reach the highest potential to make himself and God proud. Think of Goliath as the wall and it shall fall down. No more feeling like a burden. I know you're hurting, but sometimes you need to ask yourself, is it worth it? Is life worth living? Should I give in? to the pain or change the way I see things? The answer will always be found. I don't want you to drown in sorrow all the way to the ground. So keep your head held high and say goodbye to the old you. You are one in a million. It's time for winning. Wait your turn to finish and shatter the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There you go. You just said that. Say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right, Thank you. Thank you, Divine.
Um, we're now waiting for uh, my other, my co-director Stephen Cushion to come out and do a panel discussion, and um, we'll see you later.